You hear nothing as the world around you suddenly glows bright as if someone fired off a tungsten ball at full power. Then the sound catches up with you just in time to hurl you across the room and smash you against the opposite wall. A blizzard of glass, shrapnel, and concrete splinters tear through the room and rake your body, leaving behind deep, bloody tears in your clothing. The building around you rumbles as it breaks and showers debris down on you. A massive support beam crashes down, missing your head by inches. You try to breathe, but your lungs are instantly choked with dust, and by instinct you begin trying to free yourself from the debris. Every breath just brings more choking dust, and despite your numerous wounds, your pressing need for fresh air overrides any feelings of pain. You try and stand, but your body doesn't respond, so instead you're forced to crawl toward a dim source of light breaking through the gray cloud of dust. Moments ago, it had been a perfectly clear sunny day, and now you can barely make out the light of what you think is the outside through the haze. The debris you drag yourself through has been superheated and burns your hands and knees terribly, but you have no choice but to keep crawling forward toward the light. You can feel yourself asphyxiating from the lack of oxygen, your lungs struggling to pull in oxygen through the thick cloud of dust that seems to have settled over the entire world. Finally, with blistered hands, you crawl through a hole in the debris and fall forward, tumbling out into the street. The scene that awaits you is almost too much to believe. Barely 30 seconds ago, you'd been speaking to your boss, seated at his desk with a window behind him overlooking the street below. The sky was perfectly clear, save for a few stray clouds, and the sun shone fiercely. Outside, people went about their daily business, unlike almost every other major Japanese city. Hiroshima had been left completely untouched by American firebombing raids. You shuddered to hear the reports coming from across Japan of massive firestorms started by American bombs, leaving nothing but ash in their wake and tens of thousands dead. A horrifying thought, but had the war gone differently, it would have been Portland or San Francisco and Los Angeles in ashes. War was hell, but nothing could have prepared you for this. The firebombing raids had sparked blazes that lasted for days, but the once thriving city of Hiroshima has been reduced to ash and rubble in half a minute. The destruction is almost too much to comprehend, and looming above you, filling the once clear blue sky, is a massive pillar of dust and ash miles high, topped with a foreboding mushroom cloud that roils with soot-blackened clouds, spreading across the horizon at incredible speed. You're lucky, you were over a mile from the detonation point and looking in that direction, all you can see is a barren moonscape of rubble. Like most Japanese cities, the majority of Hiroshima's buildings are made of wood, and the atomic blast instantly leveled these. Only a few brick and mortar buildings were left standing across a landscape of ash. Suddenly, you feel the wind begin to pick up, and in the span of moments, a hurricane-force gale tears through the shattered cityscape. Debris is sent flying by the hurricane winds, and you do your best to flatten yourself as best you can while trying not to get blown away. Before you, another survivor is being picked up by the wind when suddenly a large wooden slat smashes into them hard enough to send them flying. The impact is so sudden there isn't even a scream, as you simply watch their broken body get blown away into the smoky fog and haze that settled around you. Just as suddenly as it began, the wind dies, leaving behind an eerie silence in its wake. Other sounds begin to fill the void, the roaring of fires, the cracking and breaking of buildings around you, and the high-pitched screams of animals in distress. No. Not animals, you realize. People. Survivors. A man stumbles through the thick haze, his high-pitched screams almost inhuman. Finally, thankfully, his voice cracks and breaks, and his screams turn to loud, ragged wheezing. His clothes hang on his body in shreds as he stumbles toward you, and it appears that he's no longer wearing shoes. As he draws nearer, you make a horrifying discovery. It's not his clothes that are hanging off him in tattered shreds, it's his flesh. He was caught out in the open when the bomb exploded and the searing heat burned his clothing off in a flash, melting and flaying his very flesh until it hangs off his bones in long, ragged strips. Despite yourself, you choke and gag from the vomit that fills your mouth. Mercifully, the man slumps to the ground just a few feet away from you, his ragged wheezing slowing and finally stopping. Death is a mercy for the horribly disfigured stranger, but you can hear the screams of dozens, hundreds of others all around you in a similar state. It's as if after the deafening silence of the massive blast, the world had held its breath for just a moment and then began to scream in agony all at once. As if on cue, your brain is now finally starting to recognize your own wounds and sorting through the dozens of pain signals. Compared to others around you, you're in relatively good shape. The blast threw you across the room, but you were lucky enough to be in one of the few brick buildings in the city. The thick walls held up enough to shield you from the initial explosion, but spalding from the massive blast showered you in a razor-sharp blizzard of concrete shards. Your hands and knees are thoroughly burned through, and blisters have already formed on the palms of your hands from where you crawled over the superheated wreckage to get to safety. More horrifying is your left arm. You remember standing in front of your boss's desk, the sunshine coming through the window behind you, reaching up to your arm, bathing it in pleasant warmth. 
This was the only part of your body exposed to the bomb's detonation several hundred feet above the city center. Reaching temperatures of a few million degrees in a matter of nanoseconds, even at a mile away, was enough to severely burn and blister your exposed arm, and some of the blisters have torn open in your mad scramble to safety. Now the pain washes over you with such intensity that you nearly black out, and you have to fight your way back to consciousness. You're thirsty. Incredibly thirsty. More thirsty than you've ever been before. The temperature around you is easily over 100 degrees, and you can physically feel it getting warmer by the minute. Your tongue has swelled significantly and now sticks to the roof of your mouth. You have to find water. But looking at the wreckage around you, you wouldn't even know where to look. Then you remember the river. You have to get to the river. The wind is picking up again, this time blowing superheated gusts of air that spread fiery embers amongst the ruins. Like a giant bellows, the gusts of wind feed the fires, growing them in size and intensity. The fire moves incredibly fast, almost like a living being, and you watch in horror as a patch of fire is suddenly whipped into a frenzy by the blowing wind, jumping across the street and consuming a group of people still trying to free others from the wreckage. The would-be rescuers and the victims still trapped in the ruins are incinerated in moments. You can't even hear their screams over the sounds of the roaring flames and hundreds of other human beings in similar distress. You've still got your shoes on, and you're grateful for that small mercy. Several survivors around you have somehow lost one or both of their shoes in the blast, and you can see their bare feet blister on contact with red-hot debris. But they push on anyway, seemingly with the same idea as you. Get to the river. To remain here means death. Above you, the massive mushroom cloud has now blocked out the entire sky, turning a bright sunny morning into dusk. Suddenly, big, fat, greasy drops of rain begin to fall from the sky, and you're grateful at first, turning your head up and opening your mouth wide. Your parched throat is eager for water, any water at all, but you choke as a few of the oversized drops land in your mouth and you try to swallow them down. They taste of ash. As you watch people wipe the black rain off their faces, you see the long, dark streaks it leaves behind. It is ash. Ash of thousands of vaporized buildings, atomized vehicles, bicycles, bridges, and people. The blast has caused a massive cloud of soil and dust, which is borne upwards by the superheated winds. At the top of the black column, the mushroom head above you has spread out for thousands of meters in either direction, cooling and being condensed into rain as the pressure drops with elevation. The raging fires set off by the atomic bomb have sent plumes of more dust and moisture high up into the air, mixing with the atomic cloud. The two phenomena combine a mile over your head, resulting in massive black rain droplets the size of your fingertip. You're desperate for moisture, but fight the instinct to happily lap up that falling rain. Others around you, however, can't help themselves and try to drink their fill of the ominous black rain. That will prove a fatal mistake, as the would-be survivors ingest massive quantities of highly radioactive debris. The irradiated dust and ash will burn them from the inside, causing horrendous damage before being passed by the digestive system. It'll be fatal in most cases. You rush forward against the black rain and gusts of superheated wind. The fires are raging in full force now, and you're being physically driven back from the heat of intense flames as much as 30 feet away from you. Working your way through the ruined city is like navigating an invisible maze, as you try to feel the safe, cooler areas in between raging infernos. At some points, you have to grit your teeth and plunge in between two massive fires, the radiating heat causing first-degree burns on your exposed skin. You see others attempt the same feat, but in their weakened condition they collapse from the waves of heat and fall face forward. Some pitifully try to crawl forward, but the fires are so intense that they slowly cook them alive, even from a great distance away. Finally, up ahead, there's a break in the debris. You know this city, your hometown, like the back of your hand, but it's almost impossible to navigate through the fires, the thick haze, and the pouring black rain. There are no visible landmarks anymore to give you a sense of direction, and you can only guess as to the direction of the river based on a few city parks that you pass by. Some of the only areas void of any major destruction thanks to there having been no buildings built on them. Here, people have begun to gather as they seek refuge from the blazing infernos around them. Some of the parks are too close to the burning buildings, though, and as the fire sweeps through the ruins and surrounds the smaller parks, the people huddling for safety inside of them are slowly cooked alive. You know where you are now, though, or at least you know that you're close to the river. You push against the pain and the horror with the last of your remaining strength, stumbling out of the debris and onto the sloping bank of the Ota River. Your momentum carries you forward, though, and you lose your balance as you roll down the bank toward the river below. Your numerous injuries are aggravated by the fall, and the blisters forming on the exposed flesh of your body are painfully ripped open once more. But soon, you're in the water, and despite yourself, feel relief for the first time since the world became a waking nightmare. You're surprised, though, the normally cool river water is shockingly warm heated by the massive firestorm overtaking the entire city of Hiroshima. There's others here who rushed your aid, though, and helped pick you up. You're all in similar shape, 
you were the strong ones or the ones with the least serious injuries who managed to claw their way out of the hellscape that has become Hiroshima. The rest are dead and there's nothing anyone could have done to save them. Finally, you can't bear it any longer as you plunge your filthy hands into the river and scoop up mouthfuls of water you greedily choke down. The river water is black too, choked by debris and ash from the city it runs through, but at least it's cleaner and safer to drink than the black rain that still falls from the twilight sky. You have no idea that what will come next is the death of tens of thousands more to horrible radiation sickness or infection from terrible third degree burns. You have no idea that in just three days another bomb will be dropped over Nagasaki, another city so far spared the wrath of the war, only this bomb will be many times more powerful than the one dropped on your hometown. Like the people of Hiroshima, the citizens of Nagasaki have been spared so far on purpose, as part of a grand experiment to see just how devastating the newly developed atomic bomb truly is. They'll hear of your plight in a day or two. The reports from Hiroshima are so astonishing that most will outright refuse to believe it. One man who will immediately accept the reality of nuclear warfare, though, is Yoshio Nishina, Japan's chief nuclear physicist and head of the nation's own efforts to build an atomic weapon. Confused by the devastation, he'll be dispatched to Hiroshima, arriving within 24 hours and confirming the worst. The city has been the victim of an atomic attack. Now go check out America's Nuclear Warriors, Global Strike Command, or click this other video instead.